This is the only image I'm, th I'm afraid you'll see during my 20 minutes, um, but it's more than sufficient. It covers a large territory. Um, before I start with a few remarks on um, boundaries and borders and so on, I should also like to thank the organizers of this symposium. And of course, I'd like to thank Deborah and Adrian and Anne for their infatigable um, efforts in getting this off the ground. It's really wonderful to be here. And also the, uh, all the technical assistance I just received from people up there who you don't see here, but they are the ones who also make all the lighting possible and make it possible for you to see me, even if I, even if I do see you just a little bit. So let's first talk about borders and boundaries in the Tibetan area. A lot of borders, a lot of boundaries, as you can see from this map. I mean, it borders on Xinjiang, it borders currently Xinjiang, it borders on northern Ch northwestern China, eastern China, western China, on a um, little bit of uh, uh, Yunnan and Sichuan provinces, uh, it borders on the northern Himalayas, Bhutan, uh, Bhut well, Bhutan is kind of Tibetan, it's a Tibetan uh, cultural area. Uh, northern Nepal, northern India, Ladakh, uh, bits of Kashmir. And then it goes all the way into uh, um, um, eastern Pakistan, into Baltistan, and even Gilgit. There's one mention is made of a text uh, that dates from the 4th, 15th century, written by a man who himself comes from Ngari, from West Tibet. And he obviously was able to use a number of old manuscripts that he found um, in various monasteries, especially the monastery of Toling, in, in Ngari, one of the fam most famous monastery built by a man called Halama Yeshe E, and in Jizampo. And um, in this particular document, he quotes mentions made of Ngari extending all the way into Gilgit and even portions of Swat. So Ngari was a very large area, which is now usually referred to as Ngari Korsum or West Tibet. The first mention made of the borders that a Tibetan area encompassed, or the Tibetan Empire encompassed, we find in the Tangshu a portion of which was later translated into Tibetan, and we find this mentioned, this, uh, the, these borders mentioned in the so-called Red Book, or the Debtor Marpo, written by a man called Kunga Dorje in the mid-14th century. We then come across a series of um, uh, uh, mentions of uh, borders in the 822-823 steel inscription, um, where the term satsam and sotsam may be the first time uh, uh, of its occurrence, which we are usually translate by border, um, either natural or ethnic, or perhaps even um, a political uh, border. Um, this term then recurs in the 14th, in the 13th century, and I'll talk to you about that in a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> then we have also a kind of a hazy sort of boundary being created between the Tibetan area as such and China as such, in a text called the Kachim Kakoma which is a text that was found allegedly in a hole in, the, in a beam of the Jokang Temple in downtown Lhasa by a man called Atisha, who is now a Bangladeshi who came from the Dhaka area and came to Tibet, Central Tibet in 842, uh, 1042. And he allegedly found this particular text where mentions made of the domain over which the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara rules, which starts from northern Nepal all the way up to what then was thought to be Gyanak or China. And China was then mentioned as a domain of another Bodhisattva, the domain of Manjushri. Avalokiteshvara, of course, is well known to have reincarnated himself into one of the, into the earliest uh, temple or emperor, if you will, of the Tibetan Empire, Sun Tzu Gampo. And then later on, he reincarnated himself in many different uh, lamas, the last of which is a series of lamas of the, um, Dara, of the Dara lamas, but also of the Karmapas. So there's an interesting kind of uh, competition, competition between these two important um, lines of reincarnation. We have then in the 13th century, we have a number of Tibetans traveling back and forth into China and from the Tibetan area into China. I say Tibetan area because at the time, there was no real, Tibet was not a, was not a nation state of any, of, of, any, of any kind that we can imagine a nation state might have, might have looked like. And this is a man called Karmapakshi, who in his autobiographical writings writes about various borders that he's crossing. 
Uh, these are no doubt ethnic borders rather than borders between two different states. But he's one of the first ones to have mentioned the term, to mention the term sotsam or satsam, which, as I mentioned to you before, uh, just now, about five minutes ago, occurs in the 822-823 steel inscription in Lhasa. <clears throat> The next traveler is a man called Pakpa, or Drogan Pakpa, who was the um, fifth patriarch of the Sakya school, ended up going to China, becoming the chap court chaplain of uh, Hubilai, then elevated graduate into national precept and then into an imperial precept, which was the highest ecclesiastic office uh, of the UN state. And he travels also back and forth to China several times and to the Mongol court. And on his way, he says, here in Taozhou, or uh, uh, um, and, you know, Taozhou, or um, what's the other term? Taozhou and, I forget the other name for this area. Um, he says this is the border between Gya and Pu, which means the border between China and Tibet. So there was a definite idea of uh, boundaries was certainly in the air at this time in the mid 13th century, in the second half of the 13th century. And these can either be interpreted as ethnic borders or either also borders, uh, boundaries between uh, two, um, in, past, in a way, civilizations. The notion of China being controlled by Manjushri or being the Bodhisattva ex machina, being uh, a Manjushri for China, uh, finds its first articulation in a Tibetan text, as far as I can tell, in a biography of an indefatigable traveler, a man by the name of Ukimpa Rinchenpel, who traveled not only to China several times, but also to northern India, and to Swat, to um, uh, East Pakistan. Hence the name Ukimpa is the man from Udiana. That's his nickname. He was uh, born in uh, 1230 and died in the 1305 or so, 1307. And he was one of the more interesting figures, and the many of them, in the, the Tibetan Buddhist world. And he um, sort of got in trouble with Hubilai. Hubilai wanted to keep him on. He want, didn't want to stay anymore at the court. He wanted to go back home. Hubilai um, uh, pursued him, or had people pursue him. He was able to escape. And he was then asked by one of his disciples, do you think Hubilai is Manjushri? He said, no, 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 I don't think so. He's not Manjushri. Later on, of course, we know that, many, that some of the Qing emperors, notably uh, Yong, perhaps Yongzhen, but definitely uh, the Qing emperor, uh, thought of himself also among his many identities as perhaps Manjushri, and he's depicted as Manjushri in many tankas that some of you will be familiar with. So we have a lot of zigzagging borders. Our first speaker for this afternoon is uh, the second speaker, the first speaker of any um, uh, note this afternoon, is Deborah Klim Exalter, who will speak about, uh, who is, of course, well known for her work on Tabo, uh, Bamiyan and a number of other areas, and she'll be uh, talking about various border crossings in Ngari. Ngari, of course, is a really interesting area. Why? Because it really tells us something about how harmful borders can be. A couple of years ago, I was uh, at a conference in Chengdu on Tibetan art and archaeology, and one of the Chinese archaeologists showed a golden mask that was found in Ngari in West Tibet. A hand was raised, if I remember correctly, and one of the Indian archaeologists who had been invited to this talk said, oh, we found a similar mask about 25 miles into our border. So it goes to show that borders are sometimes read artificial constructs. Same mask, same kind of mask, 50 miles away, but in two countries that could be hundreds of miles away as far as their political and ideological commitments are. Our next speaker will, of course, be uh, Professor Lo Hua, who will speak to us about Gonkar, Gonkar, or Gonkar Dojiden, one of the great uh, Sakya monasteries of the late 15th century, uh, very close to the airport, hence the last airport is called Gonkar Airport. And he'll be speaking to us about um, the wonderful pieces of art that can be found in this particular monastery. So borders... Are real, are real trouble, very troublesome um, notions, um, especially also in common eastern Tibet. We have a number of borders. Already in the 15th century, we have a man called Tang Tong Gelpo, famous bridge builder, who in, his, in, in whose biography we find mention made, again, 
of a Sino-Tibetan border, Gyapuri Satsam, that is Gya to China, Pu Tibet, and this is in, Dar uh, in Darzado, in, uh, in Kham, in East Tibet. And again, this must be considered to be in, most likely an ethnic boundary rather than an actual political boundary. But this is in the 15th century, the time, during the time of which the Ming didn't really claim Tibet as being part, the Tibetan air as being part of China. So we have a number of borders during the Yuan period, the Mongol period of China, and also the Mongol period of Tibet, because this entire area was called the Great Mongol Land, which included Tibet and included China. We have um, uh, borders being mentioned during the Ming period in Tibetan texts. We have borders being mentioned during the Qing period. We also have the notion of Tibet and Greater Tibet, the notion of which we already find in the steel inscription of 822, 823, which now, of course, recently in the political discussions about Tibet and what the word Tibet really refers to, what kind of geographical extent the Tibet, uh, the Tibet that we uh, all use has, has come into discussion again. Mentioned also we made here Shisha, the Shisha Empire, which is in northwest China, which is now northwest China, in Ningxia, it was an independent empire for about a couple hundred years. And we have a number of Shisha uh, monks traveling to the Tibetan area and going into India to study, one of whom was a man called Sangi Jak, Tsami Sangi Jak, who studied with a very famous Indian scholar called Abhyakara Gupta around 1110 or so, 1120. And he must have stayed in what was called the Pukang, that is the Tibetan dormitory at Vikramashila Monastery. Tropa Lhotsua, another famous uh, Tibetan, born in late uh, 12th century, died around 12, uh, 1237 in the, in, the second half, in the first half of the 13th century, also traveled uh, to Nepal. Again, Nepal here is the Kabundu Valley, not Nepal as a nation state that we know now. He wanted to go to India, wasn't able to go because of the uh, troubles, that is the troubles referring to the Turkmen uh, invasion of northern, uh, northern India at the time, had to spend his, uh, by this time, in the, in the Kabundu Valley, met a number of interesting people, among whom was also Mangal Mitra Yogan. And Mitra Yogan was a great thaumaturge, a great siddha, a great magician, magus, if you will, uh, whose biography he requested. And he requested this biography by simply asking him, hey, can you tell me something about your life? And as Mitra Yogan dictated his life story, Tropa Lhotsua wrote it down in Sanskrit because he was a Sanskritist. The Lhotsua means a translator, that is someone who knows Sanskrit. And he first wrote down the Sanskrit text and translated it into Tibetan. And the several biographies they wrote of Mitra Yogan, and we just have only the one of, of, inter, of um, middle length. And in this particular biography, Mitra Yogan mentions <coughs> the name Padmasambhava. This may be one of the first times, at the only time that I know of, that in an Indian yogi mentions the name Padmasambhava. But of course, I, I, I stand to be corrected by my, my friend and colleague, uh, Rob Mayer, whose knowledge of Padmasambhava is, of course, goes well beyond my own knowledge of, of him. So we have these imaginary boundaries that uh, cascade back and forth throughout Tibetan history. I should mention also that um, some of these imaginary boundaries also become imaginary doctrinal boundaries. A very famous example would be a man called Jonan Kungadrochok, flourished in the 16th century, who was sitting at one party of sunny afternoon in Muktinath, surrounded by a whole bunch of Hindu yogis, Shaivite, Vaishnavite yogis. They were singing Ram, 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 Ram. Others, others were singing Krishna, 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 Krishna. And he says, hey, this is just what, when we say Om Anipe Muhum, same thing. No difference. This is in his autobiography. He was one of these more, how shall I put it, ecumenical Tibetan Buddhists. Of course, Tibetan Buddhism is also very much of a, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, fluid boundaries in Tibetan Buddhism as well. And I think the term hybridity really, as, as uh, Brandon has used it this morning, also really applies to Tibetan Buddhism, which is really a hybrid um, 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 uh, uh, enterprise. Not only is, it, is Tibetan Buddhism a hybrid enterprise, but also classical Tibetan is a hybrid enterprise. 
Because if you start to look closely to the early translated literature and the early commentaries on the translated literature, you find that some authors point out that a certain term which we all understood as being Tibetan is actually a word that was a loanword from another language. For instance, the number of Zhangzhong loanwords. Yeah? And Zhangzhong was located. I'm not going to do this. I don't know which, which way to use it. Um, and so we have a number of loan, I'm sure that we have a number of more loan words from other languages, maybe even from Aja into in Tibetan. So even Tibetan is kind of a hybrid entity, um, without way, with, which we wouldn't know very much about, unless, of course, we have early Tibetan scholars pointing out that a certain term, as I mentioned, that everyone has studied, has, has, has learned to be a bona fide Tibetan word is really a word that was borrowed from Zhangzhou. Another case of hybridity, and then I'll close my few remarks here, is fashion, clothing. In the 13th or 14th centuries, when Tibet was conquered by the Mongols, we have a number of Tibetans who started wearing Mongol clothing to the great intense dislike of their fellow Tibetans who said, yeah, they're kind of, they betray the Tibetanness, our Tibetanness. And so the brother, younger brother of Pakpa, Drogon Pakpa, the fifth patriarch of the Sakya school, was criticized for wearing Mongol clothing, as, was, as, as were some of the relatives of the great Taizu Zhangjou Gelsen, who was a statesman of no uncertain qualities and acumen, lived in the, early 14, in the 14th century, who criticized some of his relatives for donning Mongol clothing as well. We've also heard of Papa Samava being the second, called the second Buddha. There's, in fact, there's an Indian precedent for this as well. We have um, Vasubandhu, the great fourth or fifth century uh, Buddhist, Indian Buddhist scholar, being mentioned as the second Buddha by another Indian Buddhist, a man called Dharma Mitra. So there's a lot of things that are going on in terms of this hybridity, in terms of Boundaries moving back and forth, doctrines moving back and forth, doctrines being adopted here, um, 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 uh, shedded over there, new ones being adopted from other places and so on. We find this all the same sort of hybridity in Tibetan medicine and as well as in Tibetan art. And I'll now stop and I thank you very much for your attention. And I'd now like to ask Deborah Klim Exalter to come to the podium. Deborah Klim Exalter is, of course, well known to anybody who works in uh, Tibetan uh, art history as one of the foremost uh, scholars of her generation, of any generation. Uh, she has worked indefatigably in many different areas in the Tibetan Himalayan world, uh, starting off actually in Afghanistan, then slowly moving uh, eastwards into, and southeastwards into um, India and into Western Tibet. And, I'd like to ask her now to come to the podium. Deborah, please. Thank you very much.